Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hi, Megan. Hey, Jess. How are you? I'm good. I'm really excited that we have our new intern, Chloe, here. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Yay. <laughs> so exciting. Awesome. We have her here for another round of nonprofit questions. And Chloe, do you want to take us away? Yes. So the first question is, I am one of two founding members of a nonprofit dentist association, which we started about five years ago. The organization was on pause for the first few years since we didn't have any money and there was a lot of fighting among the board members. There was a big disagreement and all of our board members decided to leave. My co-founder and I just found out that they're holding board member meetings and doing things under our nonprofit's name with our members. How can we get the nonprofit back? Well, that sounds like a mess. The thing for me here is that the organization got started before it probably should have. Mm -hmm. They say that it was on pause for the first few years because they didn't have any money. Um, And that there was already a lot of fighting among the board members. So right away, this group is like starting off behind the eight ball. And I just can't stress enough how you really shouldn't start anything until everybody can be on the same page about what you're doing. And, you know, recognizing that nonprofits are like any other company. It's not free to run a business. You have costs. So to start with no sort of financial plan was probably premature. What do you think, Megan? Definitely. It's like, it's hard. Sometimes it can be hard to get along when things are going well. (laughs) And when Hmm. you have no money and things aren't going well, I can imagine that any people problems get, you know, exacerbated that way. But with the amount of like disagreement this person is talking about, it makes me wonder like whether we're getting the whole story. Like, who stole the nonprofit from who? Like, who actually left? Did the co founders leave and just think they could take the whole thing because they were the founders? Or did the board? Like, I just, I have questions about how all this went down. Yeah. So that's a good point because just because you started it doesn't mean that it's yours and you own it. So when they say, how can we get the nonprofit back? Well, I, you know, I hate to break it to you, but you might have been kicked out. I mean, the, the entire board left could just be some sort of passive aggressive or denial take on they kicked us out. Yep. <laughs> and we are no longer part of the organization that we started. Um I think that that is an entirely real possibility especially cuz they said there was a lot of disagreements and that the the entire board left. If the entire board left you to, you behind and took your members with them. Like, it's not just like the board acted individually. Like, this is the entire organization except for two individuals who used to be part of it. Right. I, I, I think what happened here is the two original founders have been booted out of this organization and it's carrying on without them. So, you know, how can you get it back? Well, you can't. That's the thing about starting a nonprofit is it does not belong to you right? It doesn't belong to you at all. It belongs to the community. It belongs to the members. So you can't take it because it's not yours. So they could just go start a competing member organization. That would, that's an option. Like, sorry, you can't use the name in your state. But yeah, this this smells like probably they got kicked out. I would love to know why. Like, what happened here? There was clearly like, what sort of drama does the Dentist Association get into? Yeah, I have a lot of questions about whether to use metal or ceramic fillings. I'm like, what fundamental schism could they have possibly had? (laughs) You never know. Dentists could just be really passionate about everything, you know? Yep. Well, what else do you have for us, Chloe? This question is asking if this nonprofit idea is legal. So this person says, I'm considering starting a 501c3 nonprofit for the arts. I'm an artist. I don't make much money, but what I do make, I put towards making new work. This year I spent 
$15,000 towards the production of new art pieces. Wouldn't it be smarter to direct the funds I'm already spending on new pieces towards a nonprofit and then pay for their production through the nonprofit? That way I can lower my tax bracket. In the future, I would plan to give some of the nonprofit funds to other unestablished artists. But to be honest, the funds would mostly just be going back to me at first. So I guess my first question is, does this seem legit or am I heading towards something that could trip over in the future? And my second question is, how time consuming would it would the upkeep of such a nonprofit be? Oh, I feel like we need like a, a sound effect that plays when somebody like is a scammer that wants scammer, to have a nonprofit scammer. to like use it as a tax shelter for their own. There needs to be like a special noise. I yes. don't know what that would be. I, Maybe it's like the old, uh, like the duck with the sign on it from that Groucho Marx show, and it like blows a horn or something falls <laughs> down from the. Feeling in my home studio here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, okay. So just to take their questions one at a time. Does this seem legit? No. No, it does not seem legit. Um, are you heading towards something that you could trip over in the future? Yes. Yes, you are. You should not start up a nonprofit as a scam, as a way to avoid paying income taxes. The funny part about this question, and obviously we don't have all of the facts, but they're concerned about how much money they spent. But that's if you have a for-profit business, that's an expense which you can write it off. So, are you just doing your business badly here? Like, I don't understand. Or are you actually, if you spent fifteen grand on producing art that you sold for a profit? And you are actually paying tax on that money. Shouldn't you just be excited that you're an artist making a living? I don't get this. Like, I don't. I, if you're not making money on the art and you're spending a lot of money making the art, then maybe you're just running the business badly. That's not right. going to change by making <laughs> it a nonprofit. Well, the thing that I find fascinating with this is, I mean, yes, they're obviously trying to, as they very explicitly say, lower their tax bracket, but. Also, this person doesn't talk at all about how funds are going to come in. I feel like a lot of people who can kind of bend themselves backwards into thinking a scam is a good idea, um, you know, talk about the fact that they're going to get fundraised, fundraised money that way and they can get more money that way. And it's like, that doesn't seem to be this person's motivation. So I wonder where they think any more money will come from. Well, now, okay. I am not a CPA. I don't do public accounting. I cannot give anybody personal tax advice. But just from reading this, wouldn't it be smarter to direct the funds I'm already spending on new pieces towards a nonprofit? So they're saying I would donate my $15,000 to a mm -hmm. nonprofit. And then the nonprofit would ex have expenses. And I would get the deduction. So like, is that how they think they're going to lower their tax bracket? Because I'm pretty sure that making the charitable donation does not eliminate your income tax and that still hits you as income when it comes into your bank account. So if this were a legit nonprofit and the founder was saying, there are all these expenses that I've been paying for, can I donate the money to the organization and have the organization buy their stuff? Yes, absolutely, 100%. But this just pretty clearly seems to be something that is setting up to just line this person's pockets. And they're just really trying to find a way to get some sort of tax protection. Um, and there's a concept at the IRS level called private benefit, private inurement. And so you cannot do that. So like they're just going to get in trouble with the IRS and the tax and penalties from the IRS for those kinds of things are not something a, an artist wants to deal with. So that's kind of the first piece. And then we haven't even like touched on the how time consuming <laughs> would the upkeep of a nonprofit be. And uh, it's about 10,000 times more than you wish that it was. Yep. Well, and that's just the upkeep, let alone the actual startup process that even if you do it the fastest, simplest, easiest way possible, still will take some time and money to figure out. 
Yeah. Not to mention there's, I'm not seeing like what the public service is here. So it probably wouldn't qualify for tax exemption anyway, because the IRS, there are lots of arts organizations and they are not all C3s. A lot of them are just companies because they're there to benefit the artists. You know, they're there to provide a way for artists to make a living. And that's a defined small group of people that are privately benefiting. And that's not a public charity. So I don't even know what would be the public charity aspect of this idea. And I could probably guess that if this person came in to do a session with me, I would talk them out of it by the end of our time. Yep. I would not be surprised at all. All right. What do we have next, Chloe? Next, we have what can we do when a donor's wishes would no longer serve the purposes of the nonprofit? This person asks, I am the director of a local historical society, and we had a donor who gave us a large gift spread out over 15 years for technology and a media center. He died several years ago, and the media center has become outdated and takes up valuable exhibit space. It sounds like we can't just spend what's left of his donations on whatever we want, but how restricted are the restricted donations? If we spent the money on technology, but not on the existing media center, could that still be considered a fulfillment of his wishes? This is a good question. This is the problem with spreading out a gift over a 15 year period. Because what you don't know in year one is where you are going to be at with your programming a decade from now. Mm -hmm. That's a really long time, like a really long time. I'm guessing that there is probably some sort of error that was made in the way this restricted gift came in that they just sort of were like so excited to take the donation that they didn't really think about protecting their organization um, as much as they should have. and. Obviously, like we don't have the language here. We just know that it's a restricted gift. So who knows what it says? That brings up a question for me, for you, Jess. I like as a nonprofit noob, don't like I understand what restricted gifts are in a general sense. But what does it look like when a restricted gift comes in? Like I picture a like standard form you have to fill out of saying these are the acceptable things you can spend this on. Like how how do people typically restrict their gifts? So like if you just click the donate button on on an organization's website, a lot of times it's just a general donation to support the mission. So if the money is just coming in, and usually this is typical with smaller gifts, right? But if the button on the website says, click here to donate to our Save the Snails program, and we're an animal group that serves snails, cats, and donkeys. Well, now, <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I mean, these are important animal groups. They really are. <laughs> I, I guarantee you there is a donkey rescue organization. Well, sure 100%. there is. And if anyone is listening and knows of a donkey organization, please let us know. Shout out to you. The burrows need you. <laughs> um, so if the button says donate to this specific thing, then that may establish the intent for the donor to give to only that program. So this came this came up with the Red Cross, like, you know, they this the whole like text one one two seven to donate ten dollars to the, the Hurricane Katrina relief. I don't remember which big disaster it was, but there was a big disaster relief push where people just gave loads of money, like millions and millions of dollars came in. And the reality is, as our guest uh, previously, Jason Vienna will tell you, there's only so much you can do with a particular disaster. Mm -hmm. So if you get excess money that comes in and it's for this particular thing and you didn't spend it on this particular thing, right? We're seeing this now locally with the, what's the bail fund organization? The Minnesota Freedom Fund. Yeah. yeah. They got explosive support all of a sudden, and then people were all angry that they didn't just use $30 million instantaneously on bail. It's like, well, what are the logistics of even doing that? So 
the donor can create the restriction because we were stupid in the way that we asked for the money mm -hmm. is one way. But then the other way it can happen is bigger gifts. So this is a significant gift. They would have considered this a, a major gift. It doesn't say how much it is, but it's you know spread out over 15 years. It paid for all the technology and media center that's like hogging up some of their space. So I'm guessing it was considerable to them for their size of organization. So when you're dealing with major gifts, you know, you're like, hey, I'm I'm giving you enough money to like do the new MRI wing at blah, blah, blah hospital. That's a different ask and that's a different process and that's a different relationship with that donor. And a lot of times those things are, those come with contracts, there's naming rights and, you know, the structure of how those gifts are done is written down because the donor is doing this for tax strategy as well as their philanthropic intent. So there's, they're a lot more complicated at that level. And so it could be that there was an agreement in writing about what they were going to do with this money that it almost functions more like a grant at that point. And so it could just be that they were so excited to take this money, they kind of just didn't think about the fact that 15 years was a long time. Well, and 15 years ago, thinking about technology, we thought we knew exactly what you would need, you know? Oh, it's good like, gravy, right? Now they're like... changed. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's... Pot I mean, without seeing the documents, who knows? But they could still spend the money theoretically on technology and a media center. There could be a way to still spend the money in a way that would honor the donor's intentions. But, you know, depending on how much money we're talking about and whether the estate is still around or the family is still around, you know, there are things you could do to go back and like get their blessing. But this is a tough one because it, you don't want to poop all over this person's very generous gift or make their family angry or just have a bad PR thing around it. So. Yeah, I would need more information to give them a better answer, but there's got to be a way. Not to be scammy, but I do have the question of like, this donor has died. Maybe there is no family. There is no one tracking this gift anymore. Um, what is the real risk of spending this in a slightly different way? Like well, say it, still on technology, but not on the media center specifically. At the least, you would risk an audit finding. Because restricted dollars are kept on the books in a, a different way. So nonprofit accounting is specialized and we have assets that are restricted. And then we have assets that are released from restriction as we spend them on their intended purpose. And so if they're getting audits, they definitely run the risk that their auditor would, you know, notice this and report them for, you know, violating FASB 116. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh my God, that's my voice accounting good. voice. When you count the beans, you must push up your glasses and use that voice. Very important. Yes. Accounting Jess is here. Okay, cool. That answers my questions. Because when I saw that, I definitely had questions about this too. So that's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I suppose there could be IRS consequences if it were ever to be found out. I don't know. I feel like there's got to be a way to fix it within the rules. But ultimately, the lesson learned here is be careful when accepting restricted gifts and be cognizant of like what you're agreeing to. to oh, totally. Yeah. And be careful how you ask for money. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask for money in a stupid way, you might accidentally create a restricted gift and back yourself into a corner. Well, Chloe, I think you've got one more for us. Yes. Sorry, I was trying that voice. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go and it get some a little work. practice you need, to, yeah. you need to get up here in your nasal area <laughs> next question I can't get it <laughs> <laughs> we'll have non-accounting Chloe here for the rest of the, <laughs> the podcast I think <laughs> okay so the next question asks what's stopping a person from purchasing a mansion through their nonprofit? Bum, bum, bum. 
What's stopping a person from selling their mansion to their nonprofit in order to take advantage of the nonprofit's property tax exemption and using that mansion as the headquarters for their nonprofit, where they can also live? This is supposing the person completely pays off the home's principal payment to qualify for the exemption. Couldn't everyone just start a nonprofit and have their home property tax free this way? I'm just like, who is asking these questions on the <laughs> internet? Where are you getting this, Megan? Oh my goodness. I think this person it. really wants to do this and they want to know what kind of trouble they'd get in. You know, they're like asking for a friend, not yeah. for <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I, I feel like if you have a mansion, you probably have like a, a, a financial person that can help you figure out a better tax shelter for yeah. your property. Call your lawyer. Oh, man. Okay. So, first of all, you know, that's a good uh, start to an answer. <laughs> there's just so many things here. First of all, what the hell would you be starting this nonprofit for? Right. Like this is just because nonprofits have tax exemption, I should do nonprofit. That's it just like what even would be the exempt purpose of this organization? So let's just pretend that they actually have a mission and that they start start an organization and they would like to quote unquote sell their mansion to their nonprofit, which I read to mean the nonprofit would buy the mansion from them with dollars. Sounds like that it. That would come from where exactly? That's right. my next question. Where would the nonprofit have received the funding to afford to purchase a piece of real estate? So that's presup. So let's just pretend. This fictional missionless nonprofit exists and has mansion buying money. Now, the board of directors, because what this person doesn't know is that they actually need an independent board of directors that are not just them, would need to execute their fiduciary duties and make a decision that's in the best interest of the nonprofit and decide that purchasing this mansion is a good idea and is in the best interest of the nonprofit. So I'm not sure why the board would do that unless the mansion was actually going to be used to deliver the mission. So if like the mansion was going to be converted into a group home for people with traumatic brain injuries or veterans or, or you know, young mothers or so, <laughs> like maybe, but then they say this person's also going to live there. And I have the feeling that if you have a mansion and you want, you know, to have a tax scam, you probably aren't going to want a bunch of people with TBIs, PTSD, or newborn babies living with you. Probably not. So I, this just smells like a complete scam. But the other part I don't get on this is that they would take advantage of the nonprofit's property tax exemption. Now, I don't know what state this person is in. So I don't know what their property tax exemption rules are for nonprofits. But when I was in-house, I dealt with this a little bit in more than just Minnesota. And you don't just get property tax. Sometimes people think like nonprofit equal tax exemption, like two plus two equal four. And nonprofits can, but do not necessarily get income tax exemption, but they still have to pay payroll tax, property tax. And so unless they live in a magical state where you just get it because you exist, which has not traditionally been my experience, you have to prove to the county that you're actually utilizing the property for your exempt mission. So like when I worked at Pheasants Forever, we might get a piece of property that was like something that we could, you know, somebody would donate it to us, but it's an empty lot in a subdivision and it can be sold for cash. Well, we're not, you know, we're not using that to 
do wildlife conservation. Like nobody's installing a tiny prairie on this residential lot and like, you know, waiting for the birds and the wildlife to come use it. It's just an investment property that is going to be turned over for liquidation. So they would have to pay the property tax on that property because it's not being used for their actual mission purpose. I mean, if there's a state where you just get property tax exemption because you are a nonprofit corporation, I need to know. <laughs> Somebody let me Good know. information, yeah. Put it in the in little communications box on my website because I want to know about it. Charity Therapy Show. Yeah, Charity Therapy Show. Send me your information about the state that gives away property tax because that, that pays for city and schools, right? Yeah, they're so like, not going to want to give up that tax just because you say you're a nonprofit. No, the tax base is very important to local government and it usually pays for the schools. And so it's not just something that they give away like, oh, yeah, here you go. Sure. I guess you don't have to pay. It's fine. <laughs> so, yeah. Couldn't everyone just start a nonprofit and have their home property tax free this way? God, I wish it worked that way. Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> Oh, uh, such a sassy episode today. Well, when people are being scammy, they deserve a little sass back. Yeah, I'm thinking all the questions were a little scammy. All of them. Apparently, there's yeah. just a large population of potential scammers on Reddit. Although I will say, of course, I pick out the more interesting questions. Yeah, it's I mean, like this there's is plenty of well-meaning effect. people, yeah, who are asking very like mundane or specific nonprofit questions that would not necessarily play well on a podcast. Megan but. just likes it when I get to be sassy on on the show. That's we got to pull I'm out there. Jess's sassy side <laughs> and her accountant voice in every episode going forward. <laughs> we need to count the beans. Apologies to my CPA buddies. <laughs> yeah, accountants are great. We love you. You're very important. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Well, that was great. Uh, thanks for being here today, Chloe. Thanks for having me. Right on. Awesome. We'll do this again All soon. All right. See you later. Bye. All right, folks. That's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.